And for our fourth talk, we're going to be talking to Nick Craver about all the different sorts of attacks that have come to Stack Overflow or attacks in general. Being a top 40 site, uh, I'm sure Nick and the architecture team has seen more than their fair share of uh, unique things come their way. And he's going to go over them and things that we can learn. So Nick, over to you. Oh, God. All right. So let's pop up some slides here. Window. All right. Let me see if that comes across OK. Is that working? No, it's a yeah. Looks good. OK. So, uh, so Ben asked me to talk about some of the attacks we've seen. Uh, and then we got to listing them, and we couldn't stop giggling. So this should be highly entertaining. Uh, either this will be edited a little bit to be made public, some of the things that aren't quite finished yet. There's some tales at the end we'll put towards the end. Uh, or someone above will be like, oh, God, never show this to a customer ever. Uh, one or two ways. So let's get started. OK, so uh, this is called DDoS. If you want it yourself, do it right, and you will see why uh, this is a spot-on analogy later. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Craver. I'm the architecture lead, Stack Overflow. Uh, a lot of teams participate in what I'm going to talk about, uh, SRE teams, the devs, the core team. It's Everyone's been attacked in various ways. Uh, this goes from careers to ads to SRE to all the dev teams and um, that kind of stuff. So. Here's what we're going to go over. All right, so there's a little small stuff. This is kind of boring. We get it out of the way, right? Uh, little things that every kind of website experiences. You Google for what are the type types of attack uh, attacks you see. This is what you get. Uh, there's benevolent stuff. Uh, these are things that people didn't actually mean any harm, but really caused a lot of trouble. Uh, and sometimes it's actually hard to tell uh, complete incompetence hitting us under massive load versus uh, actually trying to harm us. <laughs> so you'll see some of these. Uh, there's by users for users. These are people being jerks. Uh, this happens, people trying to format each other's hard drives. Uh, just uncool, right? Uh, there's DDoS, which stands for Distributed Denial of Service. It's not always distributed, but we call it de Denial of Service. And those are basically forms of people trying to load you down so much that you can't tell what is legit and what's not legit, and you can't serve people who are actual humans, right? There's just bots trying to pin you down and unable to fulfill your actual tasks you're trying to complete. There's ones we did to ourselves. This section is not short. You're going to enjoy it. Uh, and then there's the incident. So we'll talk about that at the end. Um, and I won't mention anything now because uh, that one will not be in the public version. So benevolent. OK, these are in no particular order, by the way. This is just the order they came out of our heads. Uh, thanks to the other people for um, helping me think of more. Every time we ask for details on one, we found two or three more we've done. So the Visual Studio extension, there is an extension in Visual Studio to, calls, uh, to call um, Stack Overflow API and see some new stuff. The start page of this extension, Bonte will remember this well, uh, shows recent questions on Stack Overflow about Visual Studio, kind of like a news feed. Uh, they didn't mean any harm, but it turns out Visual Studio is installed a lot, and this extension is installed a lot. So we're looking at the logs, and what we think is a botnet attacking us, hitting this URL, just like crazy running searches. Turns out it's just this extension that got really popular. And then they put a on their start page a feed to Stack Overflow because they like Stack Overflow. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, so now if you look in the API code, there is a cache specifically for that set of searches <laughs> that we don't flush that often. Uh, it is big enough to warrant an honorary mention in the code base. Uh, high page numbers. So this is something that happens a lot. Uh, if you're going and searching a list of things, like a, in our case, a lot of things, right? Millions, tens of millions. And you say, hey, give me the people ordered by display name and go A to Z. And then give me the first 10. That's pretty quick. Give me the second 10. That's pretty quick. Give me page 9,000. That's pretty slow because you have to crawl all the way through, even though you're only getting those 10, right? It's not about the size that you're getting back. It's how much work you're doing on what we call the predicate to figure that out. Uh, so we see various forms of this, uh, and I'll, I'll show you a different flavor of this in a little bit. There's mods trying to script things. Oh, God, uh, Taryn's seen some of this. So they'll just be like, hey, we're going to clean up all these posts at once. The mod routes are not super optimized because they're not supposed to be used that often. Uh, it turns out a lot of things go wrong when your assumptions are broken. So when the mods went to delete, you know, thousands of hateful comments or anything like this, sometimes it's fine. When they delete 100,000, it's problematic. And uh, Taryn finds it on her dashboard saying, ow, that hurts. And then we have to go figure out a mod's deleting things. This is like step eight to figure that out. 
Uh, debugging a VPN. So this is interesting. Shane's not with us anymore. Shane Madden was uh, debugging a, a employee at a hotel. Turns out they had a 10 dot subnet. This was the root reason they couldn't reach our network. And they were trying to access some things like the Addy Office tool and some accounting things. So uh, Shane went in and was trying to help them debug. It was you know one afternoon. And they said, hey, let me run this script and see how your packet's going through the routers to see what's wrong. And then he ran it and it said, oh, um, that's weird. He lost his connection to the network. No big deal. I'll just reconnect, run it again. Then the site went down. So what we figured out was he was kicked off the network because he found a bug in the Cisco firmware that crashed the first router. And then logging back in, he crashed the backup router. Uh, and then all of the sub networks, you know, uh, all the subnet traffic you know, couldn't cross and went down. So uh, rest in peace, those ASRs. Uh, let's see, mutating Git routes. <laughs> yeah, this was fun. Okay, so we had a patcher system and one of the like beta features just to get it up and running really quick was an external system would issue a patch and we wanted to patch Linux and Windows at the same time. And we said, hey, we would like to reboot the machine when it's done patching. Uh, so the first iteration of this was a Git route. Now this was fine, patcher went and it would apply patches, get things and then issue the reboot if some patches were pending. This sounds like a, not the best idea, but not catastrophically bad, right? Now combine this with a network scanner that is checking for security vulnerabilities all across the network and hitting all of your servers in a crawl. Lots of things will reboot all of a sudden at Sunday at 1 a.m. when your network scan runs. So we use something called Nexpose that crawls all of our things and ports, and it would hit these Git routes <laughs> and run them, and servers would just reboot randomly. It took us about two weeks to figure out what was happening. We've since implemented a packet capture device on the network to see that. Uh, another example of this, not internal, my logout link for a bank, you can find a tweet of this a long time ago, uh, logout was a Git link. And then Chrome adds prefetching, and every time you visit, open the page, you'd immediately log out. So that was great. Uh, we also saw this on some dev routes, old, old dev routes. We were lazy. We put Git routes that mutate things. Um, we've since changed all those to posts, you know, just part of growing. Now, by users and for users. I'm going through these kind of quick because there's a lot of examples in the how we food ourselves category. So uh, these are things where users either are messing around or intentionally screwing with users. Now, in most cases, they're actually on meta and they're telling us this is a vulnerability, please fix it. People generally tend to like Stack Overflow uh, at least more than 50%. And you can tell this because they don't DDoS us that often. Other people get DDoS far more than we do. If you're watching this talk, please continue that trend. Uh, so they formatting a drive with copy paste. This is fun. All right. So what you do is in a con in a command, you say, Hey, copy this to your console and run it from like the Unix stack exchange or server fault. These are sysadmin type of commands, right? So it turns out Unicode, which I think we all agree was a mistake. When you go through, there are control characters that say, stop processing this. This part's a comment. And there's another control character that says, start processing this. It's a comment. So with any long enough string, you can form like rm-rf slash and things like this inside of the command string by just commenting out the parts you don't want. So if you just copy and paste, you will then format your drive. This was before they had the hardening, but you know, you can pretty much form any kind of sinister command you would want. Uh, since then, Adam Lear uh, lovingly added a strip for this. So we went through and processed all the posts. I think we found like a dozen and you can't do that anymore. These are things we find. Uh, seeing if users are logged in. Okay, so what this does is it's called fingerprinting. Uh, if you've dealt with ads and uh, actually all of you have probably dealt with this with your bank. Um, ad systems do it for anti-fraud, banks do it for the same reason. They try and fingerprint your browser. So what that is, is they wanna get like, if you look at a fingerprint match and you watch a police video and they're not you know, finding the IP by a Visual Studio GUI, uh, VB GUI, sorry. They have all the points, right? How many points of the fingerprint match? This is why it's called fingerprinting. They see, are you logged into Facebook? Are you logged into Stack Overflow? Are you logged into Flickr and Yahoo and all these things? These are fingerprints. People, once you have enough points, that gets to be more and more unique for a user. So what a bank will do, and by the way, some banks send account numbers in query strings. If you're watching this, please stop doing that too, because a few ended up in our logs. Uh, so when you have the all of these checks, what it does is it visits your login route. And it puts that login route in an image. So in the image, you say the source is the login route with the return URL of an image. So in JavaScript, you can hook up two event handlers to an image element on error and on load, right? So if you attach those 
and then you put the URL in the source, then it, if you're logged in, it will go through the login route and to the image, and then it will su succeed. If it won't, it'll return an HTML page, which is an error because that's not an image and it'll blow up. So that's how in JavaScript from another site, you can tell if they're logged in or not. Now we've patched this, uh, those image routes don't work anymore. And yet banks are still trying to fingerprint us. Someone deployed the script and hasn't checked years later. Um, and also logging people out. We had log out, uh, you could get through a get request as well. And people would embed on meta users current log out in an image. And every time you visit that meta post, you get kicked out. That was annoying. We fixed that after five minutes. So these are things that users support and do, and you know, part of growing. Now, DDoS. Okay. These, we found a lot of different forms of these. I'm just going over the categories, okay? So when you do a reflection attack, what, what you do when you're dialing on the internet is not unlike calling on a phone, right? You call someone else and you have a number and they have a number and you are connected and there's two endpoints. Now we've all gotten a spam call that came from another endpoint, right? That's one part that's called spoofing. You spoof your caller ID. Now on the internet, you cannot spoof your IP without, um, because you're coming back to it. On a phone call, you've initiated a connection, it stays open. Now in IPs, if you say, hey, I am this IP, but I'm not really this. I have, someone else is pretending to be Stack Overflow. They say, I'm coming from Stack Overflow's IP and then give me information. If that information comes back, it doesn't go to them, it goes to us because they faked where they were from. It's called IP spoofing, right? So what you do is, uh, uh, one flavor of this is DNS reflection attacks. So what you do is you ask a DNS server like, hey, what you got for all these addresses? Usually something big. And then it sends a reply back. That's UDP. So it's uh, fire and forget. It's not open a connection like TCP. And that means DNS is a right thing to send a request and reflect it to someone else. So they send a very small payload to say 5,000 DNS servers and their responses come to us. It's a bandwidth attack. They try and starve us from inbound bandwidth where we can't even send uh, acknowledgement packets and things to people. So DNS is one version of that. These are called open resolvers. If you're Googling, that's what that kind of area you'll be in. Uh, Counter-Strike Reflections. This was fun. Dagus and I talked to Cloudflare a long time ago. We said, yeah, I think a lot of these Cloudflare, these Counter-Strike servers are on hacked machines. And then they giggled at us and they said, no, here's what it is. So Counter-Strike had an open problem where you could say, hey, what players are playing on your server and what maps do they have? And just in case I don't have them, can you just help me download the maps so that I won't have to get them after I connect? And so people would ping the Counter-Strike server as us, and then it would send us maps to play a first person shooter on, which you really didn't want. And it would just drown us in bandwidth. So that was fun. Um, <laughs> Cloudflare has seen a lot of these things, talking to their engineers on a call, uh, or at Fastly too, is a uh, worthwhile experience. So Slow Loris, this is probably something most people aren't familiar with. And I didn't actually know about it until we had an SRE uh, named Jason Harvey, who's very, very good at this. He worked Reddit before here, he's, he's at Reddit again. Uh, Slow Loris is you open a connection, and when you have a connection on a web server or a load balancer or things, it takes resources. You got to track it. You got to open it. You're using a resource someone else can't use. It's a starvation attack, right? So slow Loris is we will close the connection if we haven't got any traffic from you in 30 minutes or 90 seconds. We, we employ this, right? So slow Loris is like, well, screw you. I'm going to send you a bite. <laughs> And then I'm going to wait 90 seconds and I'm going to send you another bite. You know, like, damn it. <laughs> so this is an attack against timeouts to maintain that up. I didn't know this was a thing until we were looking to move from Cloudflare to Fastly and we were testing these things out uh, at the time. So uh, that's uh, something that is not an issue today. Fastly does guard against this if you're curious. Uh, camera botnets. This is another one uh, Dagus and I tracked down one time. We were getting all sorts of attacks from... Uh, usually HTTP based attacks hitting us on various uh, routes and things. You know, some some attacks are bandwidth, which is like, you know, lower layers of the OSI stack. Just you're, you're trying to starve you from bytes. Your internet connection is so full, nothing that you want to can get through. That's bandwidth. Then there's HTTP attacks, in which case your application is so busy, not your bandwidth's not high, but you're processing so many things, your CPU is exhausted. You're, you're exhausting different areas of the stack, right? So in the camera botnets, uh, Mirai, I don't know how you pronounce it, actually, this is a botnet that, uh, what happened was 
people made DVRs for their cameras in their house. And what's the most capitalist thing you can do there, right? Make a company, make a product as cheap as possible with the worst security possible, sell as many as you can, and then shut down the company and go make another one. This is what camera DVR makers basically do. Uh, so you have all these little chips. Uh, <laughs> Mark's correct on the pronunciation. You have all these chips with old software that's never getting patched. That company's gone. Their website's gone. You're SOL here. And now you're just, you can just install a button on it because they have exploits, which are very well known. Uh, so these have, are just controlled by external entities. If you ever see in security talk of C2, that means command and control nodes. That's what a C2 node is when security research is talking about it. I believe we partnered with some security researchers looking at this. Uh, Dags and I learned a lot talking to them and they're like, yeah, yeah, we've been, we've been watching this thing. Check out all this stuff. So they're like tapped in and watching these because they it's not always in your advantage to shut down a botnet immediately. Sometimes you need to learn a little bit about it to either guard in the future or at some point the FBI just steps in and they're like, nah, kill it. And they just take over DNS or whatever. So. Uh, these things are um, sophisticated. The camera botnets, you could tell because you could literally go to the IP and see people's cameras out of the internet. <laughs> There's a lot of problems involved here. Um, so search engines, this is a little one. Bing bot would not enable compression despite our best attempts for like four years there. And they would just eat all our bandwidth going out because they wouldn't ask for gzip. So eventually we just stopped responding without gzip and we said, screw it. Uh, they listen now, they've gotten better. Uh, we have a good relationship with all the, the um, or at least Google and Bing. We have contacts with their team. They're making changes. They give us heads up. It's a very, very good relationship now. Uh, Unicode searches. Uh, okay, so people search, um, again, I, I don't I actually don't know. It's, it's some Asian characters generally, uh, at least that's how they present. Uh, I mean, Chinese, Japanese, that kind of thing. Basically, a lot of characters without spaces. That's the problem. When you have a search engine and it's based on tokenization, mostly around spaces, <laughs> and then you search in a lot of languages that don't have space. Remember that I said about breaking assumptions? Uh, a lot of crap just goes completely sideways. <laughs> so the search engine will be very, very unhappy with some of these searches against SO. Uh, to some, we guard against this now a little bit, but it, it can still be better. These are just annoying. They're errors in the log more than anything at this point. Um, Okay, this one uh, y'all will actually remember probably. Anyone who's been around for a while probably remembers a talk that Jack gave in Denver, our um, CFO at the time, uh, where a bunch of the tech group went and walked out. Uh, we didn't dislike his talk. It was fine. The We figured out someone was attacking us at the tag engine level. Uh, we had spotted it earlier in the day, and we didn't know what we were looking at. We were watching the CPU ramp up, and we couldn't see anything quite abnormal because it was coming through our D CDN and it would look like it was guarded against, right? So what this person had done over the course of six months was they had figured out that attacking us by asking for every permutation of questions in form of tags that you could do. So give me Java and C sharp, give me C sharp and Java, do every permutation of swapping them, go three, four, five tags and crawl through every combination you can that's uncached. It hurts. The tag engine really, really hurts. So if you go on Stack Overflow now, you can only search for at most two tags if you're anonymous uh, through that. It's a thing that no one's actually reported ever since, but this bot tried to exploit. It was actually a pretty sophisticated attack because A, they figured out over six months how to do it. We have, we have logs going back that far. We were finding this. We all got in a war room in Denver. There was a boardroom we just took over and got on the phone with Cloudflare and everyone else. And it turns out Cloudflare wasn't even on at the time. <laughs> we hadn't activated it yet. But this person had figured out that if they pointed to Cloudflare, it would happily forward the traffic onto us, even though it wasn't turned on. And since we whitelist Cloudflare, <laughs> but so their protections were off, but their traffic forwarding was on. And now they've fixed this problem, I believe. So this person was you know, given free reign to unthrottled hit us and beat up our tag engine servers. Um, that was something we made several improvements around the performance of the tag engine, limits for anonymous accounts, and we helped Cloudflare improve their system out of that. Uh, but if you're wondering what we were in the room figuring out at Denver for like a good several hours there, that's what that attack was. Uh, there's pictures somewhere. I couldn't find them. Okay. This is generally the most common form of attack against our infrastructure. Us. Uh, so <laughs> these are things that seem like good at a time. Good idea at the time. A lot of things are still good ideas. Uh, some of the things were bad ideas. We're going to go over the bad ideas. Okay. 
So first, uh, because everyone asks about this one, Stack Egg. This is like a Tamagotchi, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right. A uh, little thing you could play on the sidebar in April Fool's. We did it. I reviewed it. I missed it. And it, it loads up in the sidebar, and we're like, don't worry. It's not in the page load. It's another request, so it'll be fine. Okay, first, that's the problem. It wouldn't be fine if it's another request. This instantaneously doubles the page load on our load balancer, which, by the way, it was not designed to handle at that point in time. So Stack Egg's loading. We deployed this, and as soon as April 1st lit up, we said it's a good. And then we did it for logged in users, and we're like, okay, loads all right. It's good, because logged in is such a small percentage at that point in time for traffic that you really couldn't see the graph was doing something very bad yet. And then we said, hey, enable it for anonymous users. At that point, we doubled the traffic to the load balancer. I think we got to 59,800 some concurrent connections per second. You can go to the stackstatus.net blog, by the way, and read a lot of these. We do tell what happened. Uh, so anyway, we deleted ourselves, uh, or we took ourselves offline by DDoS our load balancer. We ran out of connections uh, because if you hit one connection and you drop from Stack Overflow, then we drop you out pretty quick. That you remember I said that can that connection, that port, that socket is using a resource, right? So when we take something uh, that's a quick hit and gone like one page load, which is our normal traffic 99% of the time, that works very well. When you send a second request, <laughs> like it's for stack egg, we say, oh, you're gonna be around doing some stuff. And the point at that point in time, the keep alive would bounce out a little bit. So instead of keeping your connection open for five seconds, we'd keep it for 30 seconds or 90 seconds, right? Uh, so this meant each request coming in held for instead of five, 30 or 90, and quickly your usage goes up and then you fall over. So that was fun. Uh, regex in the homepage. This one's actually pretty simple. There's a Balfa, a Balfa um, did a talk about this at one of the meetups. It is online, it's on YouTube. Basically, uh, someone committed a post, and we couldn't figure out what this was for a little while now. And we looked at the air logs. The only hint that we had was in the air logs, there was a scroll bar <laughs> in the area for the form. And then we it was like, that looks weird. And we scrolled left and right, and we, we said, that's weird, and moved on. And then about 10 minutes later, we came back to that, and we're like, that is weird. Someone put 30,000 spaces at the end of a post. Turns out we had a regex that really, really didn't like that. And then when that post got a little bit of upvote action, it then appeared in our interesting queue for the homepage, which then observed that post. Now, all of the site is working fine. The questions are up and everything else is there. But since it's the homepage and is the health check, when the homepage ate it, then everything eats it <laughs> because the load balancer went, that server's dead. Uh, that's what that regex was. And now we have a regex timeouts in place as well as we fix that overly greedy regex. Um, Image compression. Oh yeah, so this was fun. So we're on a hangout with George in the middle of a outage, a middle of a maintenance window upgrade. And George starts, he said, all right, I'm taking the sites down. I said, all right, it's good. George's walking back and forth, it's fine. Then he starts going to the thing and he starts freezing. Like, well, that's usually not good because he's on dual gig network connections from the data center. So once he starts freezing, we see the sites are, the load balancers are going down and we've run out of bandwidth. Now it turns out that what uh, Peter Grace, one of our former SREs had done, uh, or a uh, former IT, it was before we had the split. He had uh, done a fantastic blog post on the server fault blog. You can go search for this about spectrum analysis in New York office. This is a basically a blog post of, it's a miracle you can walk in and out of the New York office without glowing, there's so much radiation. So there's all these spectrographs and everything detailing this. Turns out you really should compress your PNGs. Uh, what we were doing is we said, hey, the site's down for maintenance. If you would like status, go to the server fault blog. Server fault blog, hosted by the same data center, is now serving about 20 meg of images a pop on the front page load. So we quickly ran ourselves out of bandwidth and DDoS ourselves with that one. Um, exception logging to a file share. All right. So what this was is once upon a time, before we had exceptions in SQL, and he was been here around here a really long time, probably remembers when we used to log them to Web 10. There was a folder on Web 10. Turns out if you have enough exceptions all at once, you can exhaust the bandwidth, the file system, like Windows locks the file system at a certain point of contention. If you just like hammer the hell out of the file system trying to write ex exceptions to the disk, which is funny because we only kept the last 500 or so. Uh, and it was just, it, by the time you could glance, those 500 were gone. <laughs> it was just locking up the web server, ran it out of bandwidth, took meta offline so people could ask. There wasn't a redundant meta server back then. All sorts of fun. 
Uh, since then, we have now fixed that problem, and we've beat that record by many times. You can throw a half billion exceptions in a few minutes, and we can log them. It's pretty impressive. Karen will complain about blocking when it happens, as she should. Uh, but you can log a lot of exceptions if Redis goes sideways. That's what we figured out. EF Core. Okay. So when we migrated EF Core from, uh, to 2.0, we were moving from link to SQL, and we deployed the entire network uh, very carefully. I thought uh, we, you know, did canaries, so we rolled it all out, and it worked great. Uh, we we found a few bugs here and there, and we fixed them. Then we deployed StackExchange.com as really an afterthought of, hey, this doesn't even need a whole lot of attention because StackExchange.com is like really not that highly used. Turns out it's kind of important. So there's one little query that used a GUID that says, hey, where this GUID equals this thing, then link to SQL translated that to a SQL query and got back like 50 posts. <laughs> now, EF Core will helpfully do client, what's called client-side evaluation. It's like, I can't translate that to SQL. So I'll just translate all of the where clause that filters things to what to SQL that I can, and then I'll filter the rest when it comes back. That works fine unless you have theoretically 140 million network posts on a table for every single page load. So every time you went to someone's Stack Exchange profile and viewed their questions or answers tab, it would stream 140 million posts to that web server, and it would then filter out the ones it wanted. This was less than efficient. So once we figured out the outage, this was uh, Shane was watching a network graph. We learned that SQL Server, using only 4% CPU, will happily saturate a 20 gig network connection, just flushing crap out of memory to you. It's very, very efficient. So it took us a little while to actually figure out why it was having trouble. And it was because it was pulling, um, well, given the time duration, probably, you know, 50, 60 billion posts across the network in a couple minutes. Um, so we covered the Git route. I'm sorry, I meant to move that theater slide. So that's been solved. And reboot in their own data center. This one's on me. Uh, we were installing a data center in Denver. Uh, this is our backup DR data center for most purposes, although Stack Exchange Data Explorer runs out of it, data.stackexchange. The Denver data center was all cabled, all ready to go. We finished patching uh, new servers, and we were going to boot it up. Turns out NY and CO are different characters in your console. I actually rebooted the New York web tier completely. We were in the wrong local system. And uh, amazingly, no one noticed. The servers come back up in about... 30 to 60 seconds with, when you're not patching them and it just reboots. And so they staggered a little bit naturally and we were only down for about five or six seconds. Uh, but it's amazing. You can just say reboot the whole web tier and we only go down for just a little brief period of time. But we've learned not to do that. There was a thing in the script that defaulted to NY we didn't know about. That's um, since been corrected. Actually, we just removed that part of the script. We're like, this is a really bad idea and delete things. StackExchange.com. Uh, there's a sticker for this, uh, not unlike the alert false badge. Turns out in the uh, in StackExchange.com, we deploy DNS as uh, code. So we have a DNS config. This is something that um, Tom and Craig and some others have worked on to deploy all of our DNS out of a repo in the SRE thing. So we change a thing, we push it up. Now, if, for example, you were to take StackExchange.com at the top of that file and accidentally delete the C, before you pushed, uh, it would take all of our DNS worldwide down and all of our websites would become inaccessible. Uh, this is exactly what happened. So, <laughs> and it took a little while to figure out what happened. Then we finally went to a PR like, nah, this looks good, this looks good. That must be an, no, oh God, we removed the C. So Stack at Hange was on the internet for a little bit. Stack Exchange was not. Um, yeah, that didn't really go so well. So rep is the next thing we could think of here. When we recalc rep very recently, uh, Taryn probably knows it was a couple months ago, maybe um, four or five months ago, when we redid questions and we said, hey, questions are worth 10 rep again. Uh, we went through, we ran the numbers. We said, hey, this many, November. Oh, God. Well, that's been like four years ago. So uh, the rep recalc, we expected to recalc this many people that were affected by the questions in this much rep history. What we had failed to realize is that we also update the vote. So in the vote table, we also say how much the target rep was worth. Uh, totally forgot to factor that in. So we updated way, way more in SQL than we wanted to. Lots of update statements, lots of T logs. And when we blow up um, 
the the t-log buffer between sql servers the secondary gets behind a little bit even with a 20 gig connection like if you're doing enough it takes a little bit to catch up and with, since we query on the secondary for things like badges we're like do you have this badge yet and do you need the badge that's one query it's like hey do you meet the criteria and do you not have the badge well you can meet the criteria but the fact that you have the badge came from the primary and hadn't gotten there yet so we'll just award the badge a couple of times until it catches up and then there was cleanup and there was fun and that's actually still a current problem in the system with the uh, lag it's not something people can attack us with but it is uh, ways we can attack ourselves and this is the sticker they gave kyle after removing the e from stack exchange so that's still on his desk he sent me this live from florida <laughs> yesterday when i asked him which letter it was uh Okay, so I know you didn't think that was all of them. Okay, so this is other things we've done to ourselves. Um, this The active router console, uh, this is something probably no one outside of SRE knows. Uh, George told me about a time he went through and he was pasting to edit. He was like, wow, this would be a really nasty way of doing something. What do you think? And uh, selected the wrong window when he hit paste to show me. So this went into a live router instead of notepad to <laughs> show me his bad idea. <laughs> That router was not on the internet for a little while. Uh, it was pretty simple, but it did take, uh, it took half of the redundancy down. People didn't notice, that's why. Uh, everything's redundant in Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange, if you didn't know. There's two I two sets of ISPs. Each one has two links to the internet, uh, you know, dual, dual sets of dual routers, dual sets of dual load balancers. Everything has two power supplies. Everything has two networks. So some of the fails we have, uh, some of those protect us, some of those to protect users, right? Um, so one of the things that we have two of is power supplies. Now, why does this get fun? Now, power supplies, I am emphatically of the opinion, should not have an operating system on them. And if you think that sounds stupid, you're right there with me. So power supplies in a Dell server have firmware <laughs> that reports stats and everything else. Well, I, you know, why couldn't it just be a set of transistors and be done? So uh, the power supply update procedure on a Dell server is run the patching and then I swear it says leave it alone for 10 minutes and do not touch it and it will have no signs of life the server will be off the lights will be off nothing will be happening and it's updating okay now you couldn't even like blink the light on the back or something so this is what happens and then inevitably as an SRE you've been waiting for like five ten minutes right we hadn't read this this is by the way on buried in page seven part b of a document somewhere that you're supposed to wait uh so we went well let's just boot the server oh crap that's not working okay i guess we'll yank the power and put it back in now that breaks the power supply <laughs> because you've erased mid os update you've yanked the power uh the bonus is the way the firmware replicates, you don't want a power supply that's on one OS version and a power supply that's on the other OS version. Why? I couldn't explain this to you. <laughs> they shouldn't have OS in the first place. So if you plug in a new power supply you get from Dell to replace it, <laughs> it will replicate the broken OS <laughs> to the other one and just bounce back and forth until you die. So anyway, we never fixed this problem. We gave this server to a very nice charity uh, and supposedly they've never unplugged it since. <laughs> you can ask Mark Kenderson on Twitter about this one. Uh, we never were actually able to solve that issue. If you wanted to reboot NYSQL 02, the one before this one, you had to go yank both power outlets and put them back in. It was non-rebootable. Uh, and since then, in terms of did we just do this wrong? Dell has yanked all power supply updates off their website. <laughs> this was finally bad enough that they'd said no more. Uh, I don't know if that's still the case or not. So related, they have a tool called OME, which you use to provision your servers. Uh, we use it for various things. Before we said, hey, find the OS drive and delete it if we wanna reprovision a server. We wanna, we wanna do servers as code. We wanna deploy them very easily, right? Even though we're bare metal. So on uh, when you boot, it says, hey, find the OS drive and erase it. Turns out it's a little less specific than you would want. So after setting up Denver during the same trip, we went to boot SQL and put it on OME. And it just happily found that giant 12 terabyte data drive, <laughs> just wiped it out instead. So that was a fun couple of days re-replicating the data across the internet. Um, this one didn't uh, wasn't an attack necessarily, but it did uh, prevent that data center from spinning back up for days because of this one, you know, I got the wrong drive kind of bug. Um, so the this Cisco bug router, this is what I was referring to earlier, where we took out the network by tacking it with a bad packet 
Now, A and B power feeds, this is something that many people will remember. Uh, this, we got attacked from our colo, basically. <laughs> uh, we were told A and B power, so if you're not familiar, A and B power feeds is I want power from two locations. It should go out the back of the server from two power supplies to two PDUs, power distribution, uh, power strips on the back of the server, a rack, basically. Those should go to two panels, like our breaker boxes. Those should go to two UPSs independently, right? And to generators and power companies. This is a good setup. Sometimes you even have three feeds going on, right? Uh, now in our former data center in New York, they plugged A and B into the same UPS rack, which was just destined to succeed, right? Uh, and then an engineer went and tinkered around with that rack and shorted out all of it. So <laughs> took out all of our racks at once. Now the beauty is, uh, Monty could give you some more backstory here in Punyon as well. Uh, we had Cassandra, we were experimenting with Cassandra for provenance at the time. It cooked that Cassandra cluster because people, people think about when you're writing to a cluster that's a quorum write or an all members write that it's safe because you have multiple servers. Okay, let me tell you, that's not true at all if you think about how pipelines work, right? You write a, a thing from the top level into the OS, into, you're saying, hey, Cassandra, write this, and it sends a command to the disk, and it sends it to the RAID controller if you have one, and then it sends it into the drive, right? Now, if you yank power to all of them at once, wherever your commands were at in that stack, all die at the same time. <laughs> They're gone. So you may not have a confirmed write back, but you're in a very bad state. And if all of them are in a RAID controller that acknowledged the write, but didn't actually write it yet, this is write caching, <laughs> all of that series of data is gone, okay? So these are things to remember about why white caching matters, even if you have multiple servers. So anyway, we don't use Cassandra anymore because we found some more downstream bugs. I won't dive, dive into that, but if you have follow-ups, ask those guys. There's, there's some interesting things around dates. Uh, Redis. I remember this because I was on the side of a highway trying to fix it. Uh, so while we were driving somewhere and welcome, I forgot which day it was. Uh, we said, hey, Redis is running out of memory. We're at 96 gig of memory. We were uh, in the box. We had 90 gig used. And we were so proud of ourselves because we had a second Redis box set up, I believe with uh, 190, 192 gig of memory at that point was the upgrade. Um, so anyway, we had a new Redis box ready to go, and we were going to replicate over to it. And then we're saying, yes, we got this. We finally arranged hardware and racking and software and everything before the end of it. Uh, well, that was not true, turns out. So what happens is when you replicate Redis, it forks the process in memory <laughs> so that future writes do not stampede what you're trying to do at least at that point in time. Uh, so immediately we went from 90 to 96 used memory and then Redis went down. Uh, turns out we do need Redis to stay up <laughs> on the websites. So the web tier goes down, Redis is down. We quickly just started with a stale cache uh, or a, a empty cache rather and kept on trucking. But that was a bit of a surprise where we were so proud of ourselves then ran the command and we're like, ah, crap. Um, Related to this, this was this is more of a dev attack. Uh, Mark Gravel can tell you um, about this one. Um, basically, there was a bull check that was backwards, and we never ever cached anything in local memory during this deploy. We accidentally broke the caching layer, and it wrote everything to Redis and got everything from Redis. Nothing was ever stored in L1 ever again. What's amazing was it took us like six hours to notice this. <laughs> Redis is so damn fast. We actually did not notice that the web tier was not caching anything until we looked at the memory graphs and went, that's weird. It's completely flat. <laughs> Normally it grows a little bit. Uh, that was kind of fun. Uh, we've since fixed that. Um, this last one I'll save, uh, this one I save for last because I think it's hilarious. So we had 600,000 concurrent websites at the time, 600, 650, somewhere on that level. We've grown over time. Now we peak in around 800, 900,000. So if you have a WebSocket and it's SSL, you need to connect and you need to negotiate that SSL connection. You know, go to a SUS website and it's like, hey, it's secured. Well, you negotiate a, uh, a cipher, you use their cipher and you negotiate an encrypted connection with them, okay? Every time you connect. Now, uh, WebSockets we wanted to build and it's very fast, it's very efficient, it's very lightweight. So we built WebSockets and just rolled through the web tier building WebSockets. That happens pretty instantaneously. Now, several factors went into this. A, there was no back off because we didn't have a problem before. Uh, there's a lot of WebSockets, okay? There's a lot of TLS, okay? Now you, re you rebuild the server and all of them need to reconnect. Now, if you don't have a back off built in, all of them reconnect instantaneously. <laughs> this is the crux of the issue. Uh, and all of them negotiate TSL, uh, TLS, 
instantaneously. So the CPU skyrockets, the network card has some offloading capabilities at that point, 10 gig, and it uh, pegs on just everything, like its processor, the coprocessor on the network card also gets very hot. Uh, so basically this melted the network card. Uh, it got so hot that it actually fractured the silicon on the board. That load balancer was taken out of commission by building this code. Uh, we had to go replace the card until that load balancer was back in commission. So this was the most impressively bad build we've had it literally killed a server um which is you know more than we've done elsewhere related to that you have a lot of web sockets open <laughs> something you don't want to run on any kind of regular basis is a netstat <laughs> so netstat if you're not familiar list the list of open connections so one of the things that we did for bosun to monitor what, how many ports were open just we just want to count <laughs> that's all we're after we want to know how many ports are open or time wait that you know we talked about earlier closing the connection when you're not using it uh ports and sockets have these stats and states they're in. So we want to collect that at a net stat. This was fine for every server we tested it on. We did not test it on the Bohemoth load balancer running 600,000 concurrent web sockets. Every time you run net stat, it normally completes in a second or two. Uh, this one, it would take 15 to 20 minutes. And it was trying to run it every minute from our monitoring system. So net stat also took out a load balancer. Um, <laughs> so you find out the once you ran top, uh, which is like Process Explorer for Linux, uh, you quickly saw what the issue was. <laughs> Netstat was running 60 times and just falling over. Um, so there's some interesting things about scale with WebSockets that it doesn't open us up to attack, but it does have some issues in and of itself, right? Um, and just to be clear, this is not by no means exhaustive. <laughs> There's a whole list of these. This is just things that we've like attacked and taken out infrastructure with. Uh, there are plenty of other like screw ups. Um, if this is a public talk, if this doesn't, does end up being public and your devs, uh, it's important to know that like everybody does this, the big boys and girls screw up as much as anybody else. Do not be afraid to fail. Just be afraid to fail in the same ways repeatedly. That's, that's good, right? Be afraid to fail because you didn't test at all. That's a healthy fear. You should be testing. You should be looking at stuff. You should be trialing stuff. The things that you don't have control over, didn't have knowledge of that screw up, do it, solve it, move on. Like this is, this has to be a fundamental concept of what we do. There can't, like blame doesn't help anybody. Dwelling on doesn't help anybody. These are things that everyone you talk to here giggles at because they're funny. <laughs> like Even though at the time they were not as funny. Um, so I think that's all of the examples I have for uh, the public version. What we're going to do now is talk about uh, something that's not yet public. So this will be where the recording cuts off. And uh, for that,